my name is Lorena Tolli. I'm a visiting PhD uh, scholar at the AP. Um, on behalf of the Public Policy and Governance Union, I wanted to give you a warm welcome to this first uh, meeting of our uh, speaker series in Ukrainization and Rule of Law. Um, the idea and guiding principle of this event was to put together the work of uh, faculty and um, affiliated scholars in the uh, American University in Kosovo uh, and give the opportunity to have a forum for a discussion on contemporary issues connected to democratization and rule of law. These two uh, topics um, are very widely uh, present in the public debate, so through this series of seminars we are um, opening the floor to a further reflection on both these concepts and how they do apply in the case of Kosovo and around it. Um, today's uh, distinguished guest with us is Louis Sell. Um, I'm very uh, honored to welcome him for his keynote speak at our uh, opening uh, of the speaker series. Um, Louis Sell uh, has, uh, is a career diplomat, served for 28 uh, years with the U.S. Foreign Service. Um, he spent eight years of his career in former Yugoslavia and was involved with uh, let's say key actors in the process of peace implementation in the Bosnian one and he also took part, an active part as the deputy political advisor to the high representative for the Bosnian peace uh, implementation during uh, the Dayton um, conference. Um, from uh, established the AP since it first opened its doors in 2003. So, so once again, okay, thank okay. you all for being present and uh, let me give the floor to Louis Sam. Thank you once again. Uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, I guess I'm, I'm honored and I appreciate bringing the introduction. Any, anyone that was listening carefully to that introduction, uh, I spent uh, most of my foreign service career, my diplomatic career, in countries which uh, ceased to exist either <laughs> shortly after I got there or shortly after I left. Uh, whether that's a coincidence or not, you'll just have to wait to learn until my, my next book comes out. Uh, about the scholar class of the Soviet Union. Uh, I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to talk much about those events. Uh, I'm teaching a class on, along with Jason on uh, on the uh, on Yugoslavia, so I'm going to try to avoid Yugoslavia. Uh, and, I, and I'm actually not going to talk a lot about the subject of this seminar, democratization and the rule of law. Uh, I will say I think it's a wonderful idea that, uh, that the AUK community can come together in a kind of a, uh, in an exchange of schol scholarly exchange of views and opinions uh, on issues, <laughs> important issues, I mean, the issues of the day or issues of the past. Uh, I really think it's encouraged, encouraged more of that and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased and honored to try to, to kick it off this, this, this round of it. What I'm going to talk about in a, in a way is what, what, uh, what makes possible international engagement uh, to, to bring about uh, to the introduction of the rule of law and democratization or to encourage democratization, at least one of the things, and, and the uh, international intervention, kind of, uh, what, what some of the factors <laughs> lying behind it, and uh, how has the uh, climate, has the, how, what are the things, how is the, the, the climate and the practice and the prospects for international intervention changed over the past couple decades? That's sort of a loose, uh, a loose uh, framework for my talk and probably about the best, best you'll get because it is going to be a little bit rambling over it. I'm going to cover lightly a lot of subjects uh, just touch on a lot of subjects, and I'll be happy to answer question, any questions uh, in the time for discussion. And I do want to—I I do want to get to that. Uh, so, when I said starting, I'm going to—I'm going to cast back to the period 1989, 1991. Uh, uh, for for uh, most of our students here, that's before you were born. Uh, to me, it's uh, it's current history. To a lot of people, it's already ancient history. 
89 and 91, the time of tremendous change in Europe, the collapse of communism throughout uh, Eastern Europe and eventually the Soviet Union. Uh, 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 the end, in some ways, of the 20th century, the end of the the end of the of the, the, the century, which was characterized by such such incredible conflict throughout Europe and the world, uh, in some ways uh, encapsulated the, uh, the era, the hopes for this new era. It seemed during President George Bush talked about a new world order. Seemed a very hopeful time. Uh, the long struggle, Cold War struggle in the United States and the Soviet Union was over. Uh, it seemed like a time of hope, uh, <coughs> encapsulated in some ways by this very, very well-known and, and uh, controversial book by Francis Fukuyama, The End of History, uh, which he, he literally means it was the end of history, but he is taking it as a metaphor for uh, the, the, uh, the transformation at the end of the 20th century the victory of liberal democracy in its 20th century conflict with totalitarianism and authoritarianism and in, 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 in the first of the fascism and communism. Uh, it seemed like it was the triumph of democracy, uh, ideologies consciously aimed at extinguishing democracy, consciously anti-democratic uh, ideologies seemed to have swept the field of struggle. Uh, you know, it was also a time of great change for the uh, and hope for the prospects of introducing a, a, a world order in which, uh, in, in which violence, in, internal violence, could be somehow uh, regulated or prevented, which aggression could be somehow regulated, in which the international community could come together in ways to, uh, to, uh, to, if not end conflict, certainly reduce it. Um, one of the one of the uh, one of the kind of benchmarks was the uh, first Gulf War, 1990. Uh, Saddam Hussein invaded his neighbor <coughs> Kuwait. Nothing particularly unusual about that in human history. Uh, but what wasn't kind of unusual was uh, a, a, a truly impressive international coalition was put together to repel it, obviously led by the United States, but uh, operating under a U.S. Security Council mandate uh, and encompassing some, I think it was 56 nations. What, what's often forgotten is the breadth of that coalition, uh, including, seems ironic now, there was a Syrian division which, which crossed the border and uh, help in the, in the, in to drive out the forces of Saddam Hussein uh, would, the, would not have been possible in the era of the Cold War, in the era of U.S.-Soviet confrontation. Uh, there would not, that, 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 that kind of a coalition would simply not have been possible. There were not, there was still the Soviet Union, there were not Soviet or Russian troops there, uh, but the Soviets didn't get in the way either. Uh, where the Soviets actually contributed something to the diplomatic initiative. Uh, so, is that a model? Uh, can can the, can the world global community come together? This is not a UN. This was a a, peace, uh, a, a military operation mounted under the authority of the UN Security Council, uh, but not a UN organization, not a UN peacekeeping mission. It was an international coalition. Uh, is that a model? Uh, the, uh, yeah, there was, there was also, uh, in, the, in, the, in the world of peacekeeping, conflict resolution, developments within the UN. Throughout most of the Cold War, uh, the, the, the peacekeeping functions of the UN had really been hamstrung by U.S.-Soviet confrontation, by the inability to get any kind of a vote in the U.S. Security Council for a tra Chapter 7 resolution, which is the only kind of resolution which authorizes the use of force. Um, with the end of the, the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, that, kind of, that conflict wasn't there. And there, was a, there, were, uh, there were a number of, the UN began to be able to mount what were, in many ways, the most impressive, the largest, the most impressive, the most uh, 
sweeping peacekeeping missions you had seen since the UN was created in 1945. There had been, of course, UN peacekeeping missions before that. Uh, some of them uh, created as early as 1947-48, in the beginning of the, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict. They're still there. But their mandates were very, were distinctly, distinctly limited, limited, often unarmed, and, 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 and never able to use force except in self-defense. Uh, beginning in the 1990s, you saw this a new era of larger, more robust UN security, UN peacekeeping missions. Uh, in, in, in many of the, some in, in Yugoslavia, the the, uh, the UN peacekeeping mission in Bosnia under four was the largest uh, peacekeeping mission mounted on even auspices up to that time. Uh, it had something like <coughs> almost 40,000 troops, uh, and uh, it. Uh, its, its leaders were the Great Britain and France, who contributed the bulk of the troops, and it operated under a, uh, under a fairly robust mandate. It was able to use force uh, for more than self-defense. It was able to use force in pursuit of the objectives which were um, outlined in its various mandates. There were other peacekeeping operations as well. Uh, in, in, uh, in Africa and in Asia. It seemed as if uh, there was uh, a, a great, uh, great uh, an increased prospect for, the, for using the mechanisms which had always been there uh, in the UN Charter to mobilize the resources of the international community uh, to, uh, to try to resolve or prevent conflict. Uh, and in some cases, these UN missions did some really impressive work. And in almost every case, they did serious work. But uh, it, 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 it quickly became seen came that a lot of these hopes were not realized. Um, the uh, UN peacekeeping missions, uh, some of them did good things. Others, uh, others had major problems or failures. But I have about two words. Rwanda and Srebrenica. Two words, uh, a lot behind that. I, 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 was, I was around Srebrenica at the time of that tragedy. And uh, so this is not the end of U.S. peacekeeping, but there were some serious problems with this model. Still are. Uh, Srebrenica helped to, lead, helped to lead to another model, and that was Dayton. The Dayton process, uh, yet another model in which one nation or a group of nations uh, takes upon itself using the military and diplomatic resources at its disposal to end the conflict. It was a conflict termination model, not entirely voluntary, involved the use of force by both NATO and uh, other, other states, including Croatia and the Bosnians themselves to terminate conflict and then to negotiate a peace. That, that operated under UN uh, resolutions. There were UN resolutions authorizing these things. But it, as, in the, uh, uh, as in the case of the Gulf War, it was not, the, the, the Dayton was not a UN peacekeeping force. The UN was not really very much involved until the end um, and uh, the, the, the Dayton Peace Agreement, the whole foundation of it, is, is, is sui generis. It's a separate agreement, not uh, operating under a UN mandate. Um, so is that a model? Dayton did. Dayton, I mean, I was part of that process, uh, an unforgettable time, summer and more. Uh, is that a model? This notion of, uh, of a, in some cases, a coalition of willing coming together. Uh, so switch now to Kosovo. Uh, Dayton, right? Kosovo was not president of Dayton. It was expressly, it was expressly to end the Bosnian conflict. Uh, I can't help it. One of the one of the things I did, my boss asked. My boss was Carl Bill asked me to come to Kosovo to talk to Ibrahim Rogova to tell him, basically, Kosovo would not be included in Dayton. It was only Bosnia, for good reason. 
uh, and I did, and, I, uh, and he said, I understand, there's good reason for that, but don't forget Kosovo. There's, you know, it's peaceful in Kosovo, but I don't, I don't know how long it's going to stay at last that way. And of course, he was right. So after Dayton, and, and to some extent because of that, uh, <coughs> violence began to escalate in Kosovo. There was already plenty of violence before against the people of Kosovo. What happened was they began to resist uh, with weapons instead of nonviolent resistance. And uh, so the international community is drawing in again. Uh, there's a, a conference in Rambouillet. Uh, the, uh, the, the French sponsors uh, describe that Rambouillet is going to be Dayton, but with better food. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I was not in Rambouillet. I was in Dayton. I, I can't describe, I can't, I can't comment <coughs> on the food of Rambouillet. It didn't end up in uh, ending the conflict for a lot of reasons, and not all of them because of the conference. But uh, violence continued, uh, ultimately uh, leading, as I think almost everybody in this room and many people in this room experienced it, uh, a, a NATO intervention, a NATO air war aimed at ending the genocidal campaign against the Albanian civilian population in Kosovo. Uh, ultimately succeeded in, uh, in the ultimately succeeded in forcing the Serbs out and in installing a UN administration. Everybody knows that didn't go into it. But so is this a, another model? Date, the, 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 the NATO intervention, unlike, uh, unlike preceding ones, did not have a UN Security Council mandate. It was impossible to get a UN Security Council mandate. Russia and I believe China uh, would not have voted for it. So NATO went ahead without a UN Security Council mandate. Uh, the UN uh, Secretary General at the time, Kofi Annan, said uh, he thought it should go ahead. And it's a pretty unusual situation. He, he in effect, endorsed the NATO intervention, uh, even though it didn't have the Security Council resolution. And international lawyers here, of which I'm not one, but will know that, in, in, at least in theory, exactly pretty theoretical, there's really only two ways the use of force is legal for international law. It's either self-defense or under a, uh, a UN Security Council Chapter 7 resolution. So the NATO campaign is pretty clearly not either one of those. So was it illegal? Was it improper? That, that, that led to an awful lot of uh, angst, a lot of questions, legitimate ones, uh, and eventually uh, led to a, uh, uh, to a creation of international commission led by, uh, led by another one of my many former bosses, Gareth Evans, a former Australian foreign minister, former head of the International Crisis Group, a, a, a distinguished international diplomat, Gareth, led uh, was one of the co-chairs of a commission which put together a report called Responsibility to Protect, trying to square the circle. What a very, very uh, under, uh, the, uh, underlying this kind of very, very significant uh, concept, thought, uh, objective here. What, under what conditions does, when a government, a sovereign government, either is unwilling to protect its people from some kind of abuse, or is itself engaging in the abuse of its people, under what conditions is the international community allowed to take action, to re armed action to prevent that? And that's, what, that's basically the, what the, the, the responsibility to protect uh, was trying to answer. It's often called R2, R2P. Uh, and uh, they came up with a report which was adopted by the UN General Assembly in the millennium, its millennium session of 2005. Uh, carefully hedged, but ultimately establishing this principle that there are some circumstances where 
the international community has both the right and the obligation to intervene. Very carefully hedged. Uh, uh, the, the, way it's, uh, the way it's written, primary responsibility for protection of their own people rests on the state involved. Uh, how, and then if that's not exercised, the primary responsibility for intervention is the international can reacting through uh, the UN or other authorized international organizations. But there is a little wiggle room there for what if, you know, what if the UN Security Council doesn't do anything or won't, can't. And uh, it's out there. It's there. It's been adopted. It's not binding. A UN General, UN General Assembly resolutions are not binding. But it's, uh, it's out there as a principle. Uh, so that's, that's another data point. I, I'll just mention two or three other things and I'll stop. And I'm kind of, the, uh, the, uh, another, another, uh, the, the, the opposition, there was a, the, the issue of responsibility to protect, or the, the whole, whole notion of international intervention aimed at Humanitarian intervention aimed at ending some kind of a conflict, some kind of an abuse of a population. <coughs> Hugely controversial, uh, very, very much opposed by many states, may, may, including but not limited to states which might be inclined to engage in such abuse. And I'll, uh, I'll just throw out Chechnya and try to maybe, we, naturally enough, we here often talk, we think a lot about the Balkans. Naturally enough, there's a lot of conflict in lots of other areas. And Chechen is also a conflict I happen to have some experience with. I, uh, I, 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 uh, I say this. I guess I was sort of the contact of the Chechen rebel government for three years for the U.S. government, and uh, met and went down there and met with them a lot. The Chechens were in rebellion from Russia, seeking independence from Russia. Uh, or something, not all, of them, not all of them maybe wanted independence. Some of them may have been satisfied with autonomy, but their leaders wanted independence. Uh, and uh, they wanted the international community to help them, to recognize them, or just help them. Uh, and they wanted to the United States to help them. And uh, we resolutely refused. We uh, said, and I, I forget it. I mean, we will never work with the Russians. We might encourage you, we might we'll help you, but the international community is never going to recognize you as an independent state or recognize your breakaway uh, aspirations. This may sound familiar to some Kosovars here, right? There was a long time, and that's what the international community said in Kosovo. A lot longer than I think you really believe. Uh, and. Uh, the, the, for better or worse, uh, Chechnya descended into war, for worse, a lot worse. Chechen, the Chechen war, in some ways, made Kosovo, even Bosnia, pale, look unimaginable worse, I think, in some ways. Uh, and I've often thought, I was quite comfortable dealing with the, the Chechens and telling them that, of course, you can't expect us to get involved. Uh, I mean, we're not going to antagonize the Russians for the sake of Chechnya. Yeah, we, we think you che the Chechens ought to have democratic rights, and, and we'll say that to Boris Yeltsin or Mikhail Gorbachev, but we're not going to, uh, if we have to choose between Grozny and Moscow, the choice is pretty clear what's more important to us, and that's, I was comfortable with that, and still am, yet, I really, I mean, looking at what happened in Chechnya, I wonder, could, should we have done something earlier? Not, not, maybe not just we, the United States, but the international community. Is there a, when we talk about intervention, we tend to talk about armed intervention, you know, like Dayton, or UN peacekeeping missions, and white blue helmets, and that kind of thing. But is there some way that you can kind of mobilize political and diplomatic resources? Could we have intervened? in some other fashion. We certainly are never going to send troops to Chechnya, but could we have intervened in some way to try to head that off as some kind of mediating role? I'll just throw that out. Um, anyway, the, um, so the, uh, 
we'll fast forward a little bit to the, the, the climate now. What, what's uh, look at what's going on in the Middle East? Right? Arab Spring, time of great hope. Uh, now what we, we've had we've had conflicts in Libya, a terrible <coughs> conflict unfolding in Syria. Uh, we have had some uh, some intervention and some not, uh, but the whole. The whole, the whole sort of terrain, the whole issue of intervention has changed. Uh, we have UN intervention, UN peacekeeping missions, not in the, not in the prospects. Our, our, what, 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 what really happened to change it, I think, is two. One is the, the US invasion of Iraq in 2003. It, it did two things. I, I, it kind of discredited the notion of international intervention, uh, for better or worse. Even though in, the, uh, in my belief that intervention was authorized under a U.S. Security Council mandate, some people question that, discuss it if you want later. Still, uh, it's a it, 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 the whole the notion of, of the invasion, and I think more more particularly the the uh, the disaster of the occupation which followed, uh, discredited the notion of, of intervention. Uh, even for better, even for other reasons, in the international community writ large, and in, and in the United States, you know, it, it, it discredited it in the United States, and the I, that's simply that's not on the radar screen in the United States anymore, uh, for better or worse. And if you believe in the prospect of intervention for good reasons, it's probably for worse because uh, we are for better. We are the only nation that's going to do. Uh, is capable of mounting a, a major military operation. Uh, so that, uh, and I'll, I'll stop. In the 20 years after the class of communism, 20 years after uh, the end of history, uh, and 20 years after this enormous upsurge of hope in a new world order, can we, can the international community come together to try and create mechanisms to more effectively end conflict, more effectively end the abuse of civilians in Rwanda or in Bosnia or in Kosovo. Uh, what's going on? Look at Syria and the two two examples: Syria and Libya. Libya, there was an intervention eventually. Uh, was it was not under UN auspices, but it was, uh, and it was uh, it was limited. There was there, there was a, there was American engagement, but Europe took the lead. Uh, at least uh, in the application of force. And it was able to work because it was small, because it was close to Europe, and I think it was able to happen at all because it was important to certain European nations, particularly for oil or for refugees. Uh, but then, let's Syria. Far worse humanitarian catastrophe unfolding there. Uh, the end, uh, but was started as rebellion against a very, an uprising against a very repressive regime has now clearly descended into civil war, or worse. And uh, is there any prospect of international intervention there? I think zero. Uh, for two, one, because it's so difficult, because, uh, and also because of the, the law of unintended consequences. Uh, no one, no, you intervene in Syria, even if the international community were capable of bringing to bear sufficient military resources in that conflict, which it certainly is capable of doing. Uh, what would be the upshot? Uh, Iraq has shown us that uh, it's sometimes easier to win a war than it is to a, a peace. So if we in the end, end of the conflict in Syria, what would come next? Are we really capable? Are we really confident that we can uh, could then control events? Um, so the circle is back to the end. The uh, and I'll try. I, I promise I try to get it back to the to the rule of law <laughs> and to uh, democracy. And and I think that uh, I, I'll do it in the following fashion. The the, uh, the end of history was the triumph of liberal democracy. Uh, and, I, and I think, right, I think 
has a good concept. I, I believe democracy is a universal phenomenon. And I think democracy is valued by, by everyone and capable of being exercised by all states and peoples. Uh, anyone, I, I was, I, I've been fortunate enough to see, anyone's ever seen people voting for the first time in their lives in a democratic election which makes a difference, no one could ever walk away from that and say that democracy isn't powerful. You know, I, I was privileged to see the first democratic election in Slovenia, in Croatia, uh, in Macedonia, in Russia, and in Kosovo. 2000, the year 2000 in Kosovo. No one, I mean, most of our students here are too young to vote. There are some Kosovars who voted there. No one who saw that, no one who saw any of these others can ever believe that democracy isn't a powerful phenomenon that people want. That said, it is also associated with, with the West, with Western traditions, Western values, Western rule in some ways. Uh, and perhaps in a self-serving way, but still, there, there is that connection. And uh, it's also, it's really very clear that 20 years after the triumph of liberal democracy, 20 years after the, its, its victory in a centuries-long battle with totalitarianism, <laughs> there is a crisis of confidence, or a crisis in the West. It's an economic crisis, it's a political crisis, and it's a crisis of values, a crisis of common values. And that, uh, <laughs> if we're going to go forward, if we're going to re recreate the sense of optimism that was there in 1991, and the sense and the real possibilities, some of which were, were, were you realized, uh, the West is going to have to overcome its crisis. It's a crisis within Europe. It's a crisis within my own country. Uh, and we're going to have to figure out some way to transmit those values uh, to the rest of the world. So I'll stop with that. Uh, First of all, I want to thank you for this great lecture. Uh, as you mentioned before, uh, the UN mission failed in uh, Srebrenica, Bosnia. But as we all know, there were lessons learned from Bosnia. And do you believe if the UN incorporated all the lessons learned from Bosnia and other missions uh, it had, uh, they would have done a better job in Kosovo and we would not have to deal today with the problems of uh, northern municipalities in Kosovo. As we know, we have witnessed uh, incidents in the northern part of Mitrovica even during the UN administration when they were promoting rule of law and <coughs> Thank you. Right, so that's, that's an interesting question. I think, uh, I think on, on lessons from Srebrenica, uh, <laughs> the, le the lessons were learned and, and uh, by the international community, and that was one of the things that Srebrenica, I think, was certainly one of the things that provoked uh, U.S. engagement leading to date. Uh, the, lesson, the lessons of Srebrenica and other uh, failures in Rwanda uh, have been, can, are capable of being learned, and people understand some of them, and they get, uh, in terms of uh, U.N. peacekeeping force. And it gets to the issue of uh, realistic mandate. U.S. UN peacekeeping forces operate under a mandate provided by the, the uh, U.S. Security Council. They're authorized to do certain things. Uh, the U.S. Security Council also gives them the resources to do that, in theory. And when, uh, when the U.S. Security Council in 1993 voted the, uh, the what's called the uh, protected areas, the mandates that led to the creation of Srebrenica and others as safe havens. Uh, basically, that, that it was that UN peacekeeping forces, not having success in ending the conflict that had led to this ethnic cleansing in Bosnia, would create areas in which they would protect refugees driven out by ethnic cleansing, uh, militarily if necessary. Uh, the UN commander at the time when the resolution was adopted, uh, General Morillon, General, was asked how many troops he needed to carry out this military mission. He answered.
answered, I need about 35,000 troops to do that. He got 7,000. So, uh, and that's why there was an understrength Dutch battalion in Srebrenica when the Serbs attacked. Uh, those Dutch soldiers had a choice to die for, to, to die protecting those Bosnian refugees or, or surrender. And it, the Dutch government made the decision it did. Uh, the, uh, so that, the, the lesson is uh, mandate and resources on a peacekeeping mission, broadly speaking. The UN mission in Kosovo was different. Uh, it's not, it wasn't a peacekeeping mission. It was a uh, governance mission. The only other place that's ever done that is East Timor, still. So, uh, I mean, it was creating kind of lessons as it went along. And uh, the problem with Mitrovica, I think, doesn't stem from, uh, it didn't stem from the UN, this, the, this shape of the UN mission Although in implementation, there are plenty of problems subsequently. That the problem was in the very beginning, uh, lack of clarity and will on the military mission. Uh, and the, uh, the what, where do you, where do you, uh, where does that military mission operate, and under what conditions? And I will also say this will not make maybe not may not make you popular here. This also. Uh, it was also uh, but uncertainty about how to respond to the violence which erupted in Kosovo after the war. When, uh, the, when, when, when NATO came in, in June of 1999, and a million refugees came back, naturally enough, uh, there was violence against the Serb population. Uh, and uh, that was a catastrophe for the Kosovo Albanian community. Uh, you would have been independent years earlier. You would be fully independent, and there wouldn't be Mitrovica if that revenge violence had not happened. All right? I, I just say it. I've said it before, and uh, I know people don't like it, but it's my view. Uh, and I say that in full knowledge that understanding what happened, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that a group of Americans subjected to the same thing would have done the same thing. I'm not, so I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that if Americans had been subjected to that kind of violence, we would have exacted revenge against neighbors we thought we, we thought responsible. Uh, but that's what you have leaders for. My name is Anton Ozzi. Um, I'm a junior here and I'm from Florida. Uh, I believe that uh, it was a test, actually, for Bosnia, the whole Bosnian war. The, the U.S. wasn't involved at first to see if Europe could actually handle a conflict after World War II, and they kind of dropped the ball, if you could say, maybe, with the whole Bosnia experience. And then the uh, U.S. actually got involved with the Kosovo War. But now, let's say, with the actual rule of law here, with uh, you, Lex, you make, I mean, really seem to be not exactly a failure, but I don't think it accomplished some of the goals that were really set forth that should have been. But I think with you, Lex, now, it's kind of taking away from the sovereignty of Kosovo, but you do need some more checks and balances. I want to see what your opinion is. <coughs> what types of checks and balances could you um, apply here in Kosovo where you can actually have a judicial system that can get rid of corruption and different ways with its own sovereignty and without the actual EU or other countries intervening in that? I hear two. I mean, the first one I heard was uh, the uh, Bosnia uh, in the beginning in the crisis in Yugoslavia. Uh, took the lead, sort of. And, and that is a, that's a really important issue. Uh, it's, uh, any successful intervention needs, needs some either state or organization in the lead. Uh, 
know, someone, someone who's going to sort of take charge, some group or something. And, and it is really very clear that it, it, as Yugoslavia, and I'll talk to the people here from my class, we'll talk about this on Saturday. But uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, the, uh, the U.S. did not want to get involved in Yugoslavia. Uh, Secretary Baker, James Baker, I, I, I worked for and with and traveled with the Soviet Union extensively. I think he was one of our great secretaries of the post-World War II era. But and he said famously in, in Boston, he's supposed to have said, you don't have a dog in that fight. And uh, which I think he was wrong. I have had a chance to tell him I thought so and later. Uh, and when, when Yugoslavia started to disintegrate and, and conflict began first in Slovenia, Euro the Europeans came to Washington. Hans von der who was then the uh, foreign minister of, of uh, Holland, but he was also, and, and, the, and the Dutch were in the lead of the Troika at the time, so he was in effect the foreign minister for Europe. And he came to, came to uh, Washington and he said, uh, the United States had taken the lead in, in, uh, in the Gulf, in Iraq, and the weak Yugoslavia is in Europe, so we Europeans will take the lead in Yugoslavia. And the U.S. said, after me, please. <laughs> and, uh, and so the Europeans did, and uh, uh, there was an EU mission which did lead to a ceasefire in Slovenia, the Brioni Accords, but couldn't go much farther than that. And that was then followed by UN, UN um, and the contact group. And so there was a, it was really not until 95 that the US got engaged. Uh, and basically, for, for after the, because it was, it was clear that Bosnia, because of the lesson of Srebrenica, and that that, 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 that entire, the entire peacekeeping mission and probably the NATO alliance was going to collapse had we not done that. Uh, when, when the Europeans, when Britain and France, our NATO allies, said we will, we will in fact, populate the UN peacekeeping mission in Bosnia uh, with ground troops, the US said, no, we won't send any ground troops. Uh, but we did issue a promise. We said, if that mission, if your troops of our allies get into trouble, we will help you get out. And so the British and the French came to the United States and cashed that check in the summer. They said, we're leaving if there's not peace. And basically, we were then obligated to help them withdraw uh, and uh, put it in a military and political catastrophe. For all these reasons came together. And the international community, led by the United States, but not alone, was able to bring both diplomatic and military resources to bear in Bosnia to end the conflict. Uh, the second question I heard was, in a way, how do you, not in conflicts, but in post-conflict situations, okay, when there's an international mission, how do you, in effect, transform the political culture of that place, or the, the political structure and the culture? And, and that's a much harder question to answer, it's a much harder thing to, uh, to accomplish. Uh, I'll, I'll, and I, and I, you know, EU-LEX, I don't necessarily want to get into what it's done and hasn't done, partly because I don't know a lot, but uh, let me just give you an example of Bosnia. The Dayton Agreement is, a, is an umbrella agreement of 11 annexes, and one of them is Annex 4 is the Constitution of Bosnia. You know that very well, because I helped write it in a modest way, very modest way. There's a working group, part of the Dayton Agreement, uh, drafting the Bosnian Constitution together with American, European diplomats, and, yes, <laughs> there were some Bosnians there, <laughs> and Croats and Serbs together, kind of hammering out a constitution and eventually agreed on one. Uh, and that, 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 that Dayton Constitution is still in effect. As you ask anyone involved, me, in 1995, would it still be in effect now? I say no. 
it was intended to be. So it established a very loose umbrella, very loose framework, kind of a non-working state. And uh, but it was intended, like the whole Dayton Agreement itself, basically, to give the peoples of Bosnia to end the war and give them a chance to, to create the kind of state they wanted. Um, they haven't been able to go beyond that. And, 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 they haven't been able to go beyond that imperfect Dayton Constitution uh, because they can't agree yet on what kind of state they want. Uh, so I guess the lesson I draw is uh, international engagement to, uh, to educate international engagement to help create conditions for, but uh, when you're dealing with things like the rule of law, uh, certainly a judiciary system aimed at uh, ending corruption, it has to be the people involved, they have to buy in, they have to do it. And you know, to indicate, you know, we, we have cost of international judges in various places, and that probably has, is useful, but it's not a long-term solution. You can't do that forever. And so, and Kosovo is coming to that point now in the Constitutional Court. So, Hello, everyone. I'm so Kiyos after that question as you. You referred as, uh, to Kauai case, or Cold War, as a peacekeeping mission from the U.S. Did it have a U.S. Security Council mandate, the Operation Desert Storm in the 1990s? And uh, was that just a peacekeeping mission or going after self interests As you said, that uh, the U.S. actually, in the case of Chechenia, protected its own interest. And uh, how can we compare it to Kosovo's case? Well, Knowing that it was a solo mission by the U.S. The Gulf War of 1990 very clearly had a U.N. Security Council mandate, there's no question about that, uh, authorizing the use of force uh, to repel the invasion. So it was clearly, the use of force was clearly authorized up to uh, the borders of Iraq. The, 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 uh, the coalition, the international coalition, quickly and decisively throw the Iraqis out of Kuwait. The, the, the question, uh, did it have a mandate to go further, uh, was debated and became was moot when the United States made a decision not to go further. And the coalition as a whole, but obviously the US decision, President Bush's decision was 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 important. So it was uh, it was uh, it did have a mandate it was of a, it limited objectives. Expel what was clearly an illegal invasion of the neighboring state. And the, the other question is how, how did that relate to Kosovo? Kosovo didn't have, if you talk, the 1990 war did not, 1999 war did not have a UN Security Council resolution. So, uh, to some, according to some people, it was illegal. Uh, that didn't prevent it from happening. Uh, for good reason, it was a humanitarian intervention. Uh, the aimed at, well, when the, when, what's very clear is when the, when NATO on March 24, 23, made this decision to begin bombing, its, its only objective was to get Slovan and Molusvich back to the table. It was the only objective. Uh, as the tragedy, the genocide unfolded in Kosovo, and a million people driven out of their homes, and that clearly was not enough to justify that. And it, the, eventually, NATO, again, facing a crisis of its existence, it's clear that had that campaign failed, NATO would have collapsed. Uh, the NATO community came together on a credible set of war aims, including serve all serve forces out and all um, refugees back. And that was part of the, uh, there was not a U.S. Security Council resolution. It was a, it was a, in effect an agreement negotiated among the United States, Europe, and Russia. Russia was part of that. And then taken to Milosevic uh, by Martin Gattasari and Viktor Chernomurin, the Russian Prime Minister, Tell Milosevic, you accept this, or uh, you will, we will begin to bomb you seriously. We will begin to destroy Serbia from the air. 
And that was the message he got, and he then signed. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Previously, previously you referred to mission uh, to intervention in Kosovo as a governance mission. Now you referred it as a human humanitarian mission. Which one is it now? So the mission that was governance was the UN <coughs> set up under UN Security Council Resolution 1244. Uh, the, what I, the, the mission that drove the Serbs out was that it was a NATO. It was a NATO operation. It's two separate things. The, uh, you, the UN was here after Serb withdrew in a governing role. And that was different from what happened, the, the mission to drive the Serbs out, which was a military operation conducted by NATO. I just think that his earlier question was, how did self-interest play into NATO's decision to intervene in Kosovo, if I understood you and correctly? And uh, the storm operation to work. Yeah, so you know, has he about how self-interest play out in the I think you know, self-interest, I mean, the self-interest of NATO, U.S. and NATO intervention in Kosovo is harder to see. But I think we had a, we believed we had an obligation or an interest in preventing genocide anywhere, and particularly in Europe. We had an interest in, pre, in uh, preventing conflict from spinning out of control in the Balkans and in Europe. But not in Chechen. Uh, as I said in Chechnya, I think we made the determination that, number one, we, I mean, we didn't have capability. And number two, we had another interest, and that was good relations with Russia. You know, that's, it, uh, that, that's, I guess, that's my answer. I mean, the self-interest was was not to, not direct in, in Kosovo. We we do have interest in. in we, we also had an obligation, I think, in Kosovo. From the very beginning, the United States had taken the lead in uh, encouraging the people of Kosovo to, uh, to kind of to stand up for their rights. You know, we were we were among we were the first when when. Uh, and this, when Serb nationalism and Serb repression, when Milosevic began his campaign in the 19, late 1980s, it was the United States that took the lead in criticizing that on human rights grounds and on adopting sanctions against Yugoslavia, against coming down, and that's why, in their wisdom, they sent me down to meet Mokhubo, you know. It <laughs> wasn't much, but it was what we did at the time. <laughs> and, so we have, I think we, we had an obligation, and we still do, which we take seriously. One of the most significant criticisms of the responsibility to protect doctrine is that it's just a mask, a humanitarian mask for regime change. And the Libyan case is often used to justify that. Would you comment on that, particularly given the non-intervention in Syria, where we now have 60,000 civilian deaths? I think the criticism that, that, that the RTP is a mask for regime change is mainly coming from those regimes which fear they might be changed and with good reason. <laughs> it's, if you look at the UN, if you look e even at the first draft of, of, the, of the commission, it's very carefully hedged. You know, intervention is a last resort. Uh, it's very clear that the obligation to protect people relies on the, on the, on the state involved. And that, that, so I, I think that, that kind of criticism is mainly from either from states busily engaged in abusing their own people or people like on the, on the left in, in the United States and Europe who are basically opposed to any kind of intervention. And, it, and that, that to my mind though, the real problem with RGB is that uh, it's simply, uh, it's almost impossible to implement. You know, uh, there, there, in the real, there's, there's, there's real world tests of military and political capability, and there's real world, there's a real world uncertainty about where intervention goes, and then there's real world uncertainty that like gets to uh, the point about Chechnya, right? There's a real world out there. You know, the United States has to choose between Bosnia and Moscow, it's going to choose Moscow, 
right? It just is. That's the reality. <laughs> if the, Ch and the Chinese, if Chinese government decide they want to repress the Uyghurs, if they decide they want to mount a genocidal campaign against the Uyghurs, and I'm not saying they are, or Tibet, is the, is the, is the international community going to organize, is the United States going to organize an armed peacekeeping intervention to stop that? No. We lack the capability, and we have many other interests out there. So all of these things, in, in international relations, the, the, one, the one quarrel I have as a practitioner, with too many, not all, but some of the academic writings or criticisms, or even political criticisms of the United States is, uh, in the real world, you've got to balance. You know, everything is about, it's a balance uh, there, you know, between objectives, multiple, multiple objectives usually. It's almost never clear. Kosovo was pretty clear. Kosovo was fairly clear, even though it took us a long time, too long, uh, for a lot of reasons, but it's seldom as clear, unfortunately. Well, thank you for your exceptional <laughs> testimony. Uh, we are really glad to have you here as our first keynote speaker. Uh, I'm sure that today we raised uh, many issues and there's much food for thought. So please keep your comments and questions for the next forthcoming uh, seminars. We're going to have a Friday uh, meeting at 5 in this uh, auditorium every week and there will be faculty and also visiting um, uh, scholars having their presentations on issues of the presentation rule of law. So please, um, once again, uh, we're, we're looking forward to, the, yeah, to your uh, attendance. So thank you all for coming here.